gracious. Is it that time of the week again? It's Friday. And it's time for cult worship. You know, it's easy enough to just sit and listen and hear the things that people are trying to say to you that cling to the outside world. You know, we would love for every moment of our lives to be devoted to that thing that we worship at the feet of here at the gates of hell. That, of course, is pop culture. Now, there's very few things in the real world that get my goat quite as bad as police treating people badly. And the movie we're going to talk about today dives real deep into that subject while also being quite entertaining and quite interesting. So, before we get any further, I want you to know that the director of this movie is British, but has an African name that I know I will destroy. So, out of respect to someone else that has a difficult name to say, I'm going to forego that and just let you know that they were the first black British director to win an award in the UK for filmmaking. And this, this movie is so much more than what it appears to be on the surface. Because on the surface, it's just another B-grade dystopian horror show, you know, bad cops, bad crime, bad whatever. But deep inside, this is a meditation on where's your line? Where do you decide that enough is enough? What does it take for someone to just lose control of that last shred of hope, of respect for authority, of civility. When is the line drawn? Today we're going to be talking about Welcome to the Terror Dome. Now, Welcome to the Terror Dome takes its name from a Public Enemy song. And if you, you know anything about Public Enemy, you know their logo is a cop inside of, you know, cross eyes. Or cross hairs. <laughs> cross eyes is a little different. That's when you get kicked in the face by a mule and your eyes go forever. Cross hairs is when you're looking at that mule for revenge, if you get what I'm saying. So Public Enemy is this powerful force of dissidents from a black culture and a black community in the 90s that was outraged by the world around them, that was seeing the world for what it was and putting that out with their music. And in much the same way, Welcome to the Terror Dome embraces so much of that anger and rage that was happening in the 90s and that continues to happen to this very day. It starts with the Ebo Landing, a, you know, anecdotal story in, in my view. I tried to find research about it and just fell short of time. So please correct me if I'm wrong, but the Ebo Landing is about slaves who were brought to this country, ready to be sold. And when they realized that they were going to be slaves, they turned around and walked in the ocean, ready to die, and did, because they'd rather be dead than slaves. That's where this film starts. That's the jumping off point for a grindhouse level B-movie dystopian shit show. 
Now, the principals in this film, a brother and a sister, a husband and a wife, a son, they are in Terror Dome, a ghetto created to take the poor and put them in one spot. And in this place, poor means black. And black means unloved and hated by the whites. Now, the police are in these caged off vehicles, patrolling, but unavailable. The faces that surround this community, this trapped behind barbed wired ghetto, are all black, save one, Jody, the main gangster of the film's girlfriend. She's pregnant with his child, you see. You know, he wanted some white love, white pussy, as it gets called in the movie, incidentally, you know. He gets it, but the grief, the problems that it causes when the biker gang leader sees his ex-girlfriend in the arms of a black man are just astronomical. Now you see, this guy, because he's white, can call in this tip to the police to raid a warehouse party where a young child is performing freestyle hip-hop because it's his passion, his art. When the police arrive to break up the party, the wolves arrive too, ready to pounce on anybody sticking around. The kid runs, Jody's captured, literally beaten into having a miscarriage just for having a child with a black man. The young boy runs in fear for his life into the depths of the warehouse. He takes a wrong turn and falls to his death. His mother, concerned, takes her father's gun and goes out into the streets looking for her son, only to find him dead. What follows is this tumult, this chaos, this horror a mother's grief transferred into murder, revenge against the gang, against the police, against anyone that stands against her. Then the juxtaposed scene of the burying of a small child in the streets and Jody's miscarriage. Life snuffed at all ends. There is no hope in this moment. They are crushed. They are finished. They are done. As Jody miscarries, her friend says to her aunt, what about Jody? What are we gonna do for her? The aunt replies, she has her own people. She can get help from them. I'm done with their shit. This pure division, this complete lack of empathy from one side to the other. We've been seeing a lot of evidence of that lately. And frankly, this is the kind of movie that should be pushed forward hard. This was made in the 90s. And things feel the same. I was alive then, I'm alive now. It hasn't gotten better, it hasn't gotten kinder. It just seethes in the surface, just simmering below boil. Well, the boil overflows in this one. As the young man's mother shoots down white gangsters and cops. She's arrested, set to torture, demanded an apology from. Well, the police kill people in the streets, people that finally take a stand against them, that rise up, take over the airwaves to announce 
they will be free at any cost. And as they snatch their freedom, we hear as Malcolm X speaks to a reporter, talking about how no man becomes free by begging for freedom. He's only free when he's willing to pay the price that freedom costs. When the reporter asks, what is that price? Malcolm X's one word is death. These people in this film are paying that price for their freedom, fighting in the streets against those who would oppress them. And we go back to Ebo. We see as the gunned down leaders of this revolution are reborn, taking their steps out of an ocean that their ancestors drowned in to finally break their chains of bondage. How sad is it that when we look at the film credits, the only person who continued to have a career, seemingly, was the actress that played Jody. One or two credits here or there for powerful, strong, active black actors. And only Jody got work. You know, Cole, it just doesn't seem right. Sometimes this world we live in just wants to fuck us. And there's nothing you can do about that. But when you make art, when you want to say something, say something. Don't be shy. Don't be timid. Do whatever the fuck you want. Because that voice might be the voice that leads to freedom. That interview, that movie, that song, it might be the one that breaks the chains, that bind us. You know, it's hard, it's hard to do this. And then think to myself, I sure want viewers. I sure would love stats. I would sure love some merch to sell. But I don't want to make money all the time off of seeing something like this and realizing sometimes I'm a part of that problem, this domination of other peoples by a society that only values us for how many pennies we can shuffle around. Fuck, it makes your heart wanna just sink. You know, you wanna give up hope. You wanna just fall into that stupor of whatever addiction you need. stand by and don't give up eventually they'll hear your voice because eventually you'll make them you know I think that's enough cult worship for the day you know I wear stuff, I shill stuff. There's links in the description. You don't need to tell me. You don't want to miss it. You know what to do. Subscribe, share, like, all of those things. If you think this has value, 
let me know. I want to hear. You know, <laughs> we might always be hated, but we're never going to be imitated. And if you never sleep, you'll accomplish what you want to accomplish, and you'll never die.